nothing good happens after 2 a.m. That's the refrain of How I Met Your Mother, the protagonist, Ted, as he narrates his adventures with friends and his attempts to find love. Repeatedly, Ted goes to tell a story revealing that what happens next is, of course, not going to go well because, well, it's happening after 2 a.m. The same could be said of Nicodemus's visit to Jesus. Nothing good happens when you have to wait until the cover of night to visit Jesus, when one has to wait until it's easy to hide in the shadows to keep the visit a secret before they go. Nicodemus is a leader of the Jews. He's a Pharisee, a good religious person who even leads others within his faith community. There's a risk in visiting Jesus, so he comes at night, seemingly confused and uncertain, but drawn to visit. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs apart from the presence of God. Nicodemus doesn't just come saying, I have seen these things, but instead comes representing a we, a group, as if he's the representative of a group, offering this front of confusion in order to try and confirm what he already believes about who it is that Jesus is. For you see, we're only in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, and Jesus' ministry only got started in chapter 2. We've witnessed all these signs, says, Nic says Nicodemus, but there haven't really been that many signs yet. There have only been two. We see water turning into wine at the wedding of Cana. Jesus is, is ensuring that this party can continue. And then it comes the cleansing of the temple. Jesus, uh, we can see from these two stories, Jesus keeps parties going and he shuts down the places that are preying on the poor. That's all that we've seen thus far. And considering the other gospels and how long it takes for other people to catch on that Jesus is the son of man, it seems uncertain that Nicodemus has already figured it all out. So Jesus meets Nicodemus's intentional confusion with his own intentional confusion right back. Nicodemus, you're just not going to get this. You're not going to see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus replies fast, not even trying to take into account what Jesus has said. Born from above? You mean from my mother's womb again? And if you're looking at just this text alone, you might find yourself siding with Nicodemus. Jesus, you are making no sense here. But for those within the community that first received this gospel, for those of us who just celebrated Pentecost, we hear these words differently. We know from elsewhere in scripture that in Christ we are born from above into a new life, clothed in the spirit and born in the spirit of God. We know that our God is different. Our God comes down to suffer for and with us in the person of Jesus. We know that the spirit of God goes where it chooses and is gifted to each of us. We know that this new life in Christ comes with terms that Christ sets, terms that include us all in God's grace and mercy. Being born from above changes us if we're open to being changed. Being born from above allows us to catch glimpses of the kingdom of God in the here and now. Being born from above allows us to live less anxiously while knowing our God, who we rejoice in always. It allows for us to know freedom, but only when we've committed ourselves to live in God's grace and mercy, recognizing that God's grace and mercy are as much for us as they are for everyone else. And Nicodemus, while well, he has made this journey, sneaking out for this meeting, clearly at least curious about Jesus, he's not willing to agree to these terms. Outwardly, he digs into his confusion, building up that front. And inwardly, he digs into what he already believes. While being born of the Spirit is old news to many of us, it's new information to Nicodemus. 
And in hearing this new information, he thinks, well, all that Jesus is telling me, this can't be the truth. I know we'd all like to think that we're nothing like Nicodemus. After all, we've never been met with new information that's challenged any of our beliefs ever before. Good, that was sarcasm. <laughs> In the study of biblical interpretation, we use something called a hermeneutical circle to help process how our beliefs are continuously shaped by our living Christ. Hermeneutical is a big word, but stick with me here. It just means that we're within the discipline of Bible stuff. But this circle is an example for us all as we examine our beliefs and we integrate new information in. This circle starts with our beliefs the things that are our embedded theologies, the certainties we hold onto, and often these might be the things we believe without even knowing why. So after beliefs, then comes new information, or perhaps even a crisis that challenges us and what we've believed all along. And this is where we find Nicodemus today. Jesus gives Nicodemus new information, and he digs his heels into the beliefs he's always had. And this is the part in the circle where we're faced with a choice. We can take the information and dig our heels in, going back to the beliefs we've always had, or we can continue the rest of the way through the circle, spending time in reflection thinking on how this information impacts what we believe, leading us towards a resolution and an integration of an old belief into a new belief. Nicodemus, faced with new information, chooses crisis mode, doubling down on what he knew previously. But Jesus pushes Nicodemus towards reflection. Jesus continues by telling him more about the Spirit and who exactly Jesus is. This circle was brought back to the forefront of my mind this week as I sat with members of the Presbytery of the Peaks in a day-long conversation called Facing Racism. The past few years have brought an uncomfortable amount of new information to our attention. And it's not just always been the amount, it's the content that's been concerning. As we've begun to grapple with the ways we've kept one another from knowing God's liberating power, as we've begun grappling with how we, the church at large, have kept others from knowing their belovedness in God. It's been uncomfortable as we've begun grappling with how we've drawn lines to keep some people in and other people out. We've all looked at our beliefs for a second time in these last few years, and it's been a lot to take in. We've all had that choice to double down on our beliefs, even the ones we're not quite sure why we hold on to, or to reflect and move towards resolution. So it's worth noting what Jesus does here. Jesus pushes Nicodemus to reflect. In the message translation of the Bible, Jesus' words back to Nicodemus are translated quite bluntly. Listen carefully, I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no heresy. Yet instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are as plain as the hand before your face and you do not believe me, what use is there in telling you of the things you can't see, the things of God? You can almost hear a pleading tone from Jesus as he continues. Yeah, you can stay where you are, Nicodemus. But there is more to the story, and you and I both know it. So just listen. 
Nicodemus doesn't say another word in this passage after exclaiming, how can these things be? We don't see where Nicodemus is by the end of this encounter. Is he so moved by Jesus, he begins reflecting and working towards a resolution? Or does he leave going, this Jesus guy is just as disappointing as I thought he would be? Much like our daily life, this story doesn't come wrapped in a neat bow as much as we'd like. But I believe that Nicodemus shows us our first impulse when it comes to new information. We're more ready than not to dig our heels into what we already know. A challenge to our beliefs can stir up fear within us. Reflection is risky. It requires vulnerability, a willingness to admit that we've been wrong, a willingness to change our minds. It might even require us to apologize. But this story shows us who Jesus is when we face new information. Jesus is the one who stays with his people in their process, who walks with us through every crisis of faith, who sits at the center both of this hermeneutical circle and at the center of our lives as we make our way through the process of integrating old and new beliefs again and again. Jesus asks us to reflect, to take the old and the new, and to consider how the Spirit is already at work in ways we cannot fathom. This passage continues, reminding us that the light of the world has already come. God's love for us all is already here. The Holy Spirit is blowing about, ready to sweep us up into their work. So let us ask, how can this be? Not out of stubbornness to turn away from Jesus, but in gratitude for the grace and love that's already found us. Amen.